Lazarus Symposium. Today, we are going deep into conversation with the renowned uh, Elena Danan, who is the distinguished French astrophysicist and archaeologist hailing from the vibrant city of Marseille, boasting a lineage, I'm informed, entwined with Greek, uh, Greek and Gotlandish roots, and her extraordinary life uh, took an unexpected turn at the age of nine when she found herself ensnared by the Zeta Reticuli, small alien greys, only to be later rescued by the Benevolent Galactic Federation, of which we've heard so much about, um, through their illustrious envoy program known as the Star Seed Initiative. And again, we turn here into a, a, a narrative, a storyline, which is uh, going to become increasingly important as we confluence into the great revelation. Encompassing Elena's remarkable um, journey, um, well, she's going to share her profound encounters with otherworldly beings and recounting tales of extraterrestrial contact, abduction, and eventual salvation in her uh, awe-inspiring, uh, which you can read about in the bestseller that she wrote, A Gift from the Stars. And this captivating memoir serves not only to captivate the imagination, but to instill a, a profound sense of empowerment within, within each of us, and urging you and I to unlock our inner uh, potential and, and dive into the enigmatic wonders that the universe offers us. You, the universe, of course, being a ultimately a cosmic feedback technology. That's what it is, as uh, I've gone to great pains over the years uh, to remind uh, myself and others that the universe simply leans in to each of us and whispers into our ear, you know, how do you want to play? And it's really up to us to set the metric and go forth. In today's conversation uh, with Elena, she's going to unveil her insights into human history, evolution, and the cosmic forces that shape our very existence. And drawing from over two decades of diligent research and immersive exploration across multidimensional realms, she illuminates humanity's remarkable journey toward enlightenment and liberation. Through her teachings, she graciously imparts ancient wisdom from past civilizations and our celestial brethren, guiding us toward a profound understanding of interconnectedness. And unity consciousness is everything. It is the hallmark of our age, which also demarcates the end of time as we understand it. So Elena, very, very happy to welcome you to Lazarus today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much, Sasha, and for the nice introduction as well. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so well, you're in Ireland. I just I just got that uh, out of you at the beginning of this, and I'm enchanted to hear uh, that you've situated yourself there. What is the energetic um, language going on in Ireland that compels someone like you to situate yourself there? First, uh, it's the protection. Uh, it's an island, and not only it's an island, it's geographically isolated from the rest of the world. But and the, the whole borders of this, this country, are, it's water. And in this country, you know, the Roman Empire never, never conquered Ireland. So there's never been a big urbanism plan. So it's still nowadays has kept the, the tribal spirit and the connection to the land, to the elements and the ancient Celtic and even pre-Celtic uh, spiritualities who are still embedded in the people, in their traditions, and even in the religion, because the official state religion here is Christianity and uh, Catholicism in the South, uh, where I live. And that is something very particular here because how Catholicism arrived in Ireland, it was hermits. It's not, uh, you know, um, emissaries from Rome. It was hermits, Gnostics. Mm -hmm. And they met the Druids and they discovered that they had everything in common. Uh, they were both finding a personal connection to, to the divine throughout nature. So they created something very special, which is the Celtic Christianity. And it's beautiful. But then the Roman Empire sent, you know, emissaries to uh, conquer this, 
these these people, but they still have the the rebellion, the rebel spirit and individuality. That's why I love Ireland because that's me. <laughs> well, let, let's hope that the Irish, that that Celtic spirit that you speak of, let's hope that that really sees you know seizes the 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 day and and overthrows this uh, Sabbatean draconian uh, government. The the government, the corporation government, of course, is the very worst exemplar of evil government, just like Canada and Australia. I think Ireland exemplifies the evil of this uh, Luciferian globalist hand. Wouldn't you agree with that? I exactly, I, I totally agree. And this is, to me, to my understanding, a very, very clear proof that the universe works in balance and the, the, the <laughs> evil works in balance with the, the, the positive, you know. As much as you will find independent spirits, and it happens in France as well. I'm French. I know the French people lead revolutions, and they are one of the most. They have the one of the most wicked governments as well. When you have an, a strong independent uh, spirit among the people in a country, well, the the dark will enforce the measures of con to constrain the people, and it you will find a very hard and steel government you know so that makes sense it's, yeah. uh, it's I, like, I like that you brought this into the conversation because you're so correct the counterpoint geometry is something we have to learn to observe in this realm of duality actually we can learn so much by understanding how this counterpoint geometry works out it can help us to navigate also where we situate ourselves and how we navigate our journey look as we move uh, towards a more open uh, conversation around the, the topic of uh, extraterrestrials and the Galactic Federation of Worlds. What are the plans for disclosure and how can we ensure this information is disseminated in a way that educates without creating fear and further division? Very well introduced. Well, the plan for disclosure, it is uh, the main uh, I would say uh, motion is to not create chaos, that to change the mentalities, the collective unconscious, slowly and nicely and smoothly, with no shock, because the last thing that people of Earth need at the moment is another chaos. So, you know, people want spaceships landing on their lawns and that would Imagine the chaos and everybody would focus on that and not work anymore to do their job, you know, uh, whatever it is. So the plan of disclosure is led by the Galactic Federation of Worlds, working with the Earth Alliance, the White Hat military, the Intergalactic Confederation, which is a bigger organization on the, above the Galactic Federation of Worlds, the Intergalactic Confederation um, is also known to uh, have the group of the Cedars. Right. They, so what they decide uh, in cooperation with the White Hats, Earth White Hats, the Earth Alliance, is to split the task. So the ETs, these two big organizations, uh, are showing the ships, their ships in the sky and on videos letting the ship be filmed etc more and more and more and also sending orbs everybody can see them to really get the populations used to to see them slowly slowly but the heart of the work is of course done on earth by so you have now all this disclosure plan these 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 whistleblowers who are just appearing from here and there which is part of the plan but then you have, you have two sides. You have, you, you we are, people are discovering that, oh, they, this, this whistleblower, which is legit, he's saying that aliens are a threat. Uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about David Grush, for instance, who is a legit whistle, whistleblower, uh, a vet and is, is, a, is a serious person. But he said, so he said that, that uh, we are, we have been retroengineering ET technologies for a while, and we have ET technology. He said, oh, but, you know, uh, ETs are a danger. But then you have Stephen Greer, who works for, on his own, not in the plan of disclosure of the Galactic Federation and the Earth Alliance. And him, he says, all ETs are good. So people say, it is, all ETs are good, all ETs are bad, while 
listen to that while people are thinking this or that, they just don't realize, oh my God, it is are real. They've been there. They've shared technology. If, if they were only focused on that, people would just freak out. But because there's, you know, this, this discussion, so it slowly and nicely brings up the collective unconscious into the realization and integration that aliens are here anyways. Very good. Very good. So what, if, what is the connection to the plan entrusted to General Van Herk, uh, to uh, and how is that, that, that plan entrusted to him? Who is he in the first instance? And how is the plan entrusted to him central to this operation you're, you're describing? Yeah, so I've had the privilege because uh, to witness uh, by distance remotely uh, something. So uh, my contact in the Galactic Federation of Worlds is an officer uh, from the Pleiades. His name is Thorhan Eredion. And we are connected by a technology, uh, a device that I have in me. And we are, it's a quantum communicator. And, and so he connected to me on January 6, 2023. And he said, now watch that through my eyes and you will need to report this. He was on earth in the Blue Ridge Mountains. He showed me with his eyes the Blue Ridge Mountains and he said, check well whether the mountains are flat you need to to remember that 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 that's there where i am and he wasn't um really uh allowed to tell me all the details because when earth militaries are involved he, are, the ets are not free to tell everything mm. you have you know military uh, top secret things and stuff so he met with General von Herk. So I didn't know it was General Glenn von Herk at the time. The location was Raven Rock, has been identified as Raven Rock facility in the Blue Ridge Mountains. When was this? When was this? January 6, 2023. Okay. Wow. So Thorhan, I saw Thorhan uh, giving to a four star general that I could really see from. from the right of his left right side of his face i never seen that before you know i'm french living in ireland i know nothing about american military and grades and i know nothing but i saw him and thorhan gave him a device and telepathically thorhan was saying to me that this device contain this device was a flat long device like we would use that as a data storage device right. he said this contains the latest update for the plan of disclosure of ET presence of our presence on Earth, plus uh, technology blueprints. So in this device are the directives that the Earth Alliance needs to follow to be coordinated with the galactics uh, in the disclosure plan. So um, I, I did quick sketches, drawings, and what I do each time, uh, I call uh, Michael Sala, uh, Dr. Michael Sala. And he said, oh my goodness, he said, okay, I'm going to send you by email uh, a link with um, 40, the photos, no names, photos of 40, 40, 40, uh, uh, four-star generals and pick one. I'm like, okay, no problems. No problem. And uh, after, after, oh, oh wow, that's him. I just, that's him. And I said to Michael, okay, that's that's this guy. I'm sure it's this guy. And he said, he came back to me, he said, wow, you're so, so on target. He said, it's, uh, you know who, it, who this guy is? It's General Glenn Van Herk, the head of the NORAD. And if there was one person, this plan should have been given to, it's him none other than him so you know i was wow and then uh, two weeks after it was in february two three weeks after suddenly you have these uh alleged balloons and ufo flying over america and suddenly general glenn van herk was on all tv everywhere talking about about extraterrestrials <laughs> So, yes, the plan is going well. It's uh, Things are unfolding according to the plan. 
Uh, the whistleblowers who are coming are going to, there are going to be more whistleblowers. Um, the law, there's a law that is being passed to protect army whistleblowers, and this was part of the plan. And uh, also is part of the plan, the new bill that's been, uh, that is going to be uh, implemented, that's been given to the Arrow Office about uh, asking all corporations in possession of ET technology to come forward. So uh, it's also part of the plan. And it has started, Sasha. It has started and it's I, not I going know. backwards. No, exactly. There's no, no going back. But in the case of someone like um, Glenn uh, uh, David Van Herk, the general in the United States uh, Air Force, as you said, who's serving as the chief of NORAD and previously served as a director of the joint uh, staff uh, in, in, in uh, 2019 and uh, until 2020. So this is a man of, of, of exemplary standing in the military. Are you suggesting that he has been visited directly by uh, non-human agents or he is receiving instructions from his masters that and he doesn't understand the source is just carrying through protocol oh he, he has met physically my contact thorhan we, who is an extraterrestrial and it's not the first time that um this general glenn von herk is meeting with aliens they are all you know, aliens are working with the governments, the, the good, not only the bad aliens who have been or now are gone right. by my sources, but the, you know, the Galactic Federation uh, has been, uh, especially the Nordic cultures who look yes. like us, you know, and uh, so, yes, uh, it was this device, this, this um, latest update was given hand to hand. It was so important that uh, it had to be given hand to hand. And something Thorhan told me, he said, of course, he said, I cannot tell you the details of this plan because it would put the plan in jeopardy, of course, no. because, you know, uh, the enemy is also listening to me. <laughs> just, but just, said, just, to go, just to go off track. Sorry, can I finish, let's finish what you're saying and then I'll, I'll bring in this other question. No, so he just said, you, but you, you just have to know this plan is pure genius. Very good. Very good. Um, where do you think, um, just to choose two political uh, icons, where do you think Vladimir Putin and, for instance, Donald Trump fit into this equation of white hat disclosure? They're both white, white hats. They're both white hats. And, they're, and they they're, have been, they, they're aware of each other's role, seminal roles. They know about each other's roles. Right. Yes, 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 yes. They have been playing... Um, Sometimes they have been they have been playing games publicly for you know because they had to, but they uh, they work on the same side. Very interesting. Yes. Very interesting. I mean, and of course it's very compartmentalized. I mean, a couple of weeks ago I was oh, yes. having I was having breakfast with one of Donald Trump's uh, former wives, who's a very dear friend of mine, and um, and she for, I've known her for years and and been friendly, and she's assured me over the year i mean over the years i've heard from her and other uh, folks very close to donald trump over the last 25 odd years what a foundationally good angelic human being he is whether you like or loathe his personality is neither here nor there he was born um with a very special mission it's pretty clear and certainly to most of my uh, audience, it will be clear. The same thing with Vladimir Putin. Their, their birthright and their uh, mission is so far above the head of the average um, political, political leader or military leader. So I, I do un understand more or less. But th the curious thing is that people around Vladimir Putin, people around Donald Trump, people around uh, General Van Herk, even family members are not necessarily privy to the information. I know that that's how it plays out. I'm no fan of Henry Kissinger. I, I find him a despicable I uh, archetype, but I know that it, it was well testamented that back in the day, I think it was in the early 60s, 61 or 62, I think it was, um, he was a young at that time. And uh, when he joined Majestic 12, I think it was, when he was brought into Majestic 12, and his family and others around him um, noticed a complete change of persona from one day to the next. He became a very somber and kind of pale creature 
once he'd been inducted into whatever wickedness was going on at that time. Um, but and the rest of, you know, he, he, he spends the rest of his life, by best accounts, being hyper compartmentalized from even members of his own family. It's a curious thing, isn't it? Yes, yes. Oh, the compartmentalization, it, it works for everything, you know. Even in the Galactic Federation of Worlds, uh, I don't have access to certain information because if I had this access, it would put the information in jeopardy, you know, because right. people are listening to me. And I mean, they know they know me. They know I, I, I never keep anything to myself. I, yeah. I, I speak. So... <laughs> You don't want me to say something? Don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> very, very, I'll remember that. So, okay, thank you for that piece. Um, but let's talk now about how <laughs> religious, um, uh, incidentally, um, uh, Dr. Michael Sala, uh, I was on with him for two hours yesterday. He interviewed me for his platform. We had a fantastic conversation. Uh, he spoke very um, affectionately about you. He's a wonderful, wonderful human being. I adore the man. Yes. But let's talk about how religious belief systems have been used as tools for fear-based control and how extraterrestrial entities played a role, seminal role in the creation of these gods. This is something which is so important, Elena, as you know, to break. Now we have to crack the myths. We've got to grow up. We have got to put away childish things at the, at the civilizational level and religiosity and the breaking down of this re religious reductivism has to take place. So please speak about how re religious belief systems have been used as a utility. It's going to take a little bit of time, but I need to really take your audience through the story. OK, uh, I do my best to condense. OK, 300,000 years ago, uh, the Anunnaki, an expedition, uh, Anunnaki expedition arrived to Earth, and these people were on board a ship called a Nibiru. The sh Nibiru is not a planet, it's a spaceship, okay? That's why it can travel to space. Anyways, uh, this expedition was com commanded by, uh, the commander of the fleet and of the, the expedition was Enlil. His name is was is Yuh. Yuh means the fiery one, Yuh. And Lil means the master of the, the armies. They arrive on Earth, and the his his mission was to own Earth, take Earth for the Anach Empire, their empire. But on board the ship was another person of the royal family, Ia, otherwise known as Prince Enki, uh, who was the first son of Anu, but um, he should have been the heir of the empire, but he was not. Uh, for some reason I develop later, and he's a geneticist and a scientist, a geneticist, and he works on the, 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 the frequency of love, the science of the universe, he's a cosmic alchemy, alchemist now, anyways. So all these people arrive on Earth, and, and Lil took Earth and, you know, took it for himself and started mining resources. And with time passing, uh, they had brought their own uh, workers. Time passing, the workers say, we are not doing that anymore. So Enlil had this idea to use the local creatures. There were hominids there um, to use them. And, but they were not, weren't very obedient. They were just very a bit savage, savages, you know, not very organized as a society yet. So they decide to alter their genetics to make them obedient and efficient at works, develop their physical abilities and make them uh, a bit dumb, you know, dumber than they were to, to be really obedient. And he asked his geneticist uh, half-brother and key, well, yeah, can you do that? That's your work. Your geneticist do that. And he said, well, that's not very ethical, blah, blah. But he hadn't the choice. So he started looking into the genetics of these hominids. And he was shocked to discover that these people, these humans, hominids, were a compound of 11 different intergalactic DNAs. And he went, wow, there's no way I'm going to dump these ones. I'm going to take a bunch of them in secret and I'm going to activate them and see what their potential is. You know, he was passionate about that, 
very passionate, but he didn't say, he didn't tell Enlil. So that's how and, and Ki and his team of geneticists, of scientists, worked on creating Adapa, known as Adam, and Eve Hawa came after. That's the story. When Enlil knew, learned about that, he was furious. So he wanted to kill these, these, these humans that were on board the Nibiru in the Eden. The Eden is the biodome. So they, he, instead of having them killed, uh, Enki managed to get them to escape to Earth and hide there. And they have, they have been breeding and they created later on the, the descendants, the line of the patriarchs, the bi biblical patriarchs. At that time, uh, and you find that, that in the scriptures, people were living, these, these humans were living 300, 500, 600 years, you know, and you go like, what? And then when you see, you read the ancient scriptures, you see the ages, the mortality, it goes going down, down, down in age. There's been some genetic manipulation from the other side, from you know, what, what happened is that humans were activated and start to be in full power and breed, um, develop this, this activated bloodline. So, and Lil didn't like that. So he decided to, the, the war started. Yes, there's been a, a series of wars, but long story short, and Lil got these humans to uh, get altered genetically. Not all of them. Some of these bloodlines could escape, but most of humanity, and he'll say, I own Earth, it's my place, and it's mine, and all creatures on it, I I they are gonna they are working for me, they are my slaves. Um, Enki lost the war, lost the battle, because Enki is not a warrior, he's a geneticist, he's a scientist, and he's a half-brother, and Lil was the chief of armies. So Enki had stood no chance and he was defeated and he had to leave Earth. And Lil remained with his son Ninurta and uh, Enki's son Marduk that Enlil uh, managed to turn to the dark side and do something very wicked with him. So these three entities, Enlil, Ninurta and Marduk ended up at ruling the Earth the Earth and the star system as well, and through to this day, okay. Um, and Lil started to be known as Yahweh. Or when you go into the the linguistic and the scriptures, and, uh, and not only the the Bible and the, the ancient Testament, but, but Mesopotamia, you know, the Torah, everything speaks about the same story. And I have traveled uh, in Mes Northern Mesopotamia and as well uh, recently in, um, in the US, um, in the Cherokee country, 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 and I discovered similarities. Anyway, um, we can talk about that later, but now Yahweh was started to be the, 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 the horrible, bloodthirsty, horrible bastard entity. Uh, splitting, splitting the, 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 you know, the Tower of Babel. It's a metaphor. Humans were, get, were getting too much together and siding together. So he had to make them speak different languages. That means it's not about languages. It's about spreading division among them, spreading division that they do not speak the same language. He did that. He, anyway, he did all these horrible things creating division, divide and conquer. Um, Ninurta later on uh, ended up uh, playing Allah. I could have been burned, burned for that <laughs> just 100 years ago. But I need to deliver the truth. Ninurta played Allah. There were other groups of extraterrestrials involved in these religions. But to make it short, and Marduk, played Satan, okay? Mm. And they were sometimes swapping and they were playing games. They've created this triad, this triangle has been, has created the deep state, you know, uh, Freemasonry and the Illuminati, 
come from this association of these three wicked beings. Through to this day, the, the aim was to enslave humanity and keep them enslaved and ignorant, not knowing that they are enslaved and taking resources, using them as, as a currency, you know, uh, for in many different ways. So, um, so then how the reptilians come into the picture, how the greys come into the picture. The greys uh, have been uh, finding Earth uh, quite recently in history. Uh, it was maybe a century ago, century ago. And but so they've been, uh, of course, there's a story that they signed treaties with the MJ-12 in 1955 uh, that sold out humanity to the, the, the grey Nebu Empire for the abductions. But so they the Greys have been involved in um, Islam because they master the cube technology. Uh, that's a long story, but they involved um, in um, in Islam. They, they have been involved in there. The reptilians. So the reptilians. It's very interesting. You have the Sikar, who are the Alpha Draconians, who have been there, but you have also the reptilian Anunnaki, who are not Sikars. It's Enlil's bloodline, Enlil. Why? The father, Anu, had two wives. Well, he had many, but two queens, two main queens. His first uh, main queen was Namu. She was Anunnaki human because Anunnaki is not one species. It's a culture of different species, you know. Um, and so Anu marries a human queen, Namu. They have first pair, Ia, Enki. But then Anu, who, they were living in the constellation of Butes. Anu got offered by a reptilian Sikar queen in Orion territories. And Anu wanted to expand his empire. And the queen says, her name was Tia, and she says, I give you rulership of all our territories in the, the Orion zone. But in exchange, we have a son and is becoming the heir of your empire. And Anu said yes, and Anu regretted because the son was Enlil. So Enlil is half um, Anunnaki reptilian because it was uh, the, the, the bloodline uh, of his, uh, his father. He was not reptilian, reptilian, but uh, kind of a gray species. It, it's a species on their own. They have reptiloid ge genetics, uh, Anu, Anu. And the full Sikar genetics. So. Enlil brings the Sikar into the picture, into the bloodlines, because he's half Sikar. So all the royal bloodlines on Earth that are involved with the dark side are descendants of Enlil's bloodline and have genetics as well as Sikar reptilian genetics. And that's the story. And that's why, as long as the Sikar reptilians were in power on Earth, Anu could do nothing. We had to expel first the Sikars. You know, so that's the big end lines of the story. Very, very there's well, no much more. Yeah, no, of course. Thank you for that. So uh, Ea is Enki and Anu is Ra. Um, yes. Enki, en Enki uh, created the Adamite, so to speak. Yes. Um, and um, Adam and Eve. Um, the Anunnaki and the Nephilim, what's the connection in very simple terms? Because I've got a bunch of questions I wrote down based on what you've just said. Um, what's the relationship between the Anunnaki and the Nephilim? It's different words to uh, qualify in different uh, dialects, to qualify the same people, the sky people. Anunnaki right. means the sky people. It wasn't their real name. Their real name is Anachim, the Anach Empire, and they are the Anachim. And uh, the Nephilim is another name to name the sky people okay. but the so, real name is Anaki. so if uh enki was of the anunnaki yes enki uh, seeded adam and eve the binary sex uh, male and female but where then is the connection of the nephilim falling to earth in order to um in order to mate with the daughters of men so which came first? Yes. <laughs> so when the Anunnaki slash Nephilim slash Anachim came on earth, there were already humans. 
hominids were the products of a genetic experiment from the intergalactic confederation, the cedars, much, much before. Uh, so they took these, the Anunnaki took these hominids, a, a bunch of them, not the whole planet, okay? It was uh, in the, the area was where Mesopotamia is now, Mesopotamia, a little bit of Africa. They, they use certain humans to create, uh, to either um, a part of them uh, enslave them, dumb them down, and the other part, which was Enki's project, personal project, he took a part and he, he put his own DNA in Adam, and this activate this played in the activation of all the extraterrestrial genomes in in Adam. Wow. You know, and they 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 made Adam was then the first product. It was the Adam was the um, the achievement of the experiment of Ia. You know, there have been many others before Adam. Yes, and um, yeah. So where does so Ninha, uh, where does the daughter of Ra, uh, the sister of en Enlil and Enki, Ninhursag, where, where does she fit in? Is that the same character as Ninhurt that you said, or Ninhurta? Is that the same as Ninhursag? No, no. Nin Ninurta, Ninurta is uh, the son of Enlil. So he's reptilian. Right. Ninurta. And he's been playing, uh, being Allah most of the time. Ninota. Ninur Sag, which is not her real name, uh, is a feminine uh, person. He, she was a sister. Um, you know, they have different family cells. They, they see family differently. She was a cousin of Ia and Ki, but yes. he could call her sister. Okay, got And it. she was human from his mother's side. Very yeah. good. But, and she was she a geneticist. Was instrument. She was also a chief scientist, right? Yes, yes, she was. Okay, and Enki and Enlil, that story, the whole telling of that story sounds very much like Cain and Abel. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, you know, this, this story has been spread in all the cultures because humanity has been is traumatized by these alien wars. They were fighting with spaceships, plasma weapons. It was firing from everywhere, every corner of the sky, burning the land. It was this, I mean, people, they, they, they've been, everyone has been telling the story of the two factions or the two brothers who were fighting each other. You find that everywhere, everywhere. I've been to Northern Mesopotamia um, two months ago. Uh, to visit the populations there. And I met the Ye with the Yezidi, who are Kurds and the descendants of Sumerians. They still speak Sumerian and they tell the real stories that they've kept. They are the memory keepers of the Sumerian, the alive, living memory, the Yezidi. That's why the, de the deep state, the Islam, ISIS uh, organization is slaughtering them, the genociding them. They want to, to get rid of them because they know the truth. Yes. The Yezidi say that Enlil was the thunder god, was holding lightning bolt. Ah, Zeus. Zeus is always uh, associated with Enlil. And Enki was the creator god who created Adam and Eve, and um, they 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 call him Malaktaos is the the, the peacock uh, angel because he was always dressed with colors, and that's true. And he had seven angels mm -hmm. to assist him, the seven sleeping giants, the seven scientists. So you know, so they know that. I went to uh, a few weeks ago. I was in the U.S. In, uh, in Tennessee, and uh, I went to a um, Cherokee reservation, and I couldn't believe my eyes. They have there the same legend. It's it's local legend, um, and like, what you have representations of an eagle. So I tell you the story: an eagle and a snake fighting against each other. The e the eagle flying the sky he has the sun behind him and he holds lightning bolts yeah. and the serpent winged serpent hold a trident 
I say, what's the story? Tell me the story. I said, tell me the story of this because it's so familiar to me. He said, well, they say, the Cherokee people one day, they saw that the sun god wanted to destroy them and they want he wanted to to kill all the humans and to do that he, he started to send lightning bolts on earth to burn the crops and uh, the people couldn't understand why uh, the sun god uh, didn't wanted to kill everyone so another god came a winged he transformed into winged, winged golden serpent and he went to fight the the uh, sun god and but he lost he lost when he lost his the scales of his armor uh fell on the earth and this golden metal we kept we kept it as a treasure and he, when he left earth he left his eggs behind <laughs> and it's it's this the same story of and lil the storm god the the lightning bolt and and key who fight, you know? Eggs, the cosmic eggs you're talking about? No, the descendants. Okay. The descendants, the bloodline. Fascinating, fascinating. The eggs of the serpent. So, and there's a story with that also. What, the serpent. What is, what is the gain for Enlil to have seeded division and bring about the kind of Babylonian complex and the division of tongues, of languages? and? What was the net gain for Enlil to see division amongst their creation? He didn't want the, he didn't want the human to realize they were slaves uh, and rebel and try to to stand up against his power. He wanted to have nice obedient slaves. He didn't want the slaves to get on together because he he knew that if these these dumb uh, hominids united. Uh, they would become strong and they could maybe one day overcome him and say, no, we don't want to be slaves and rebel and it's troubles. So let's keep them divided that they never unite. That was the plan. That, so that whole instinct for subjugation, for manipulation, for dominion, all issues really from the thrall of Enlil, right? In that sense. Yes, and yes. Enki, Enki would become, in a sense, the counterpoint. Um, the counter yeah. very very interesting I saw um, uh, last week I was watching or listening to a, um, an, a fantastic conversation that you had with our beloved mutual friend Dan Winter uh, a while ago and in this uh, I was trying to do my fitness routine whilst I was listening to this and I I stopped and I had to sit down sweating and actually pay attention because I was so compelled <laughs> You were speaking about the Vajra. I think that you were beamed. Oh, yeah. you were beamed into the presence of was it Enlil or Enki? Was Enlil? No, 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 no. Enki, yeah. So it Always, was. Yeah. You were brought into the presence of Enki. Can you? Sorry to do this to you. Can you describe exactly what happened in that event and what transpired, and speak to the Vajra as well? Well, I can't speak uh, about all what I've been talking about because I'm meeting physically with um, Enki, yeah, and that causes a lot of stir. Uh, but I do, I do, uh, about once or twice a month, uh, I happen to meet him physically. So I am brought on a ship, on board the Nibiru ship. And that day, um, he has a big library, a huge library on this ship. And this ship is actually at the moment in the orbit of Jupiter, but at the time it was in the orbit of Saturn. In this library, you know, I saw a place where there were a lot of antiques. Enki is a collector. He's an immortal. He collects, he likes to collect antiques. And he had all these ancient weapons in a room. And I said, oh, I want to see that. I want to see that. And there was a Vajra. Uh, for those who don't know, it's a dodge, I call also the dodge. On the shelf, it was a big thing. I mean, to me, to me, big like this, you know, very heavy, big, a metallic um, on the shelf. And it was the, the points were locked, well, locked. And 
I said, oh my goodness, I said, is that the ancient weapon that we see everywhere on the, the ancient carvings that the, your people when I was holding? And he said, yes, yes, uh, it's, uh, and he called it, he calls it Vaira. Right? So next to the, the, oh, that's it. So that's one that is closed. So I begged him to show me and he asked me, okay, step back, step back a few meters, okay. So there's a, a sphere at the center, and the sphere contains a crystal inside. So he took it really far from him, uh, or horizontally, and he clicked. He first he bind, he binded his consciousness to it, and he pressed the ball and the sphere. And as he pressed the sphere, he explained this to me later. Okay, uh, there's a mechanism. This sphere, it's not plain. There's a mechanism that when you press it the pressure is going to multiply exponentially by a mechanism inside. So it becomes, the pressure is so powerful that it creates a piezoelectric effect. And there is, um, I don't know what else is inside, but when it does that, the two uh, extremities open like this. And, it, and then uh, in the middle, there's a crystal point. It looks like quartz, but it was not really transparent. It was like white. And then plasma, two, I swear, two plasma, red plasma uh, jet. It was like um, a laser sword, you know, uh, like a plasma sword, double sword, you know, like in Star Wars. That's it. So exactly like in Star Wars. And it, it was, it was, um, very impressive and he was he started to move it in the air it was very beautiful to see him watching that i swear when he when he <laughs> the the two swords just vroom, appeared i i was already six to ten meters you know backwards i just ran to the, to the wall and went on the wall like oh my god <laughs> that thing is interesting is impressive and then he with the consciousness he approached it from his head and by the power of his mind, the two swords resolved in it and the prongs closed. And that was it. It was very impressive. Extraordinary. So you've just described essentially, um, you know, the legend of Thor and all of that. I mean, how these gods, which were very, very real. And again, we're going to have to wake up to the fact um, this very... Um, um, latent reductive um, religious mindset has reduced our capacity to even cogitate and ideate yes. and think much less remember uh, the majesty and the truth of our history the truth of our genesis yes. the real stories of creation have just become these kind of fables and in in in, in the stead we have assumed the the um the metric of this re religious reductivism which is even more absurd as stories. And yet that's become the framework, the conceptual framework within which we are now trying to um, uh, look back and look at reality. So what you've just described for me is the one of the most remarkable things. What, what is it that permits you to be brought in front of uh, Enki to, by best accounts, a creature that's quite diabolical in the, in the history of humankind what's changed in Enki why would he receive um, a good human like yourself and be benevolent um, and even satiate your curiosity by showing you around the ship what's changed um, since the days of old Enki has never been malevolent he's always been filled with love and the the malevolent diabolical was always and Lil. That's, so that's what I wanted to get from you. So it's always, it's one or the other. That was the whole binary dualistic principle was born out of one and the other. So there is no chance you would be brought before Enki. I mean, Enlil. Me. No, no, no. And I don't want to. No, the thing is, um, why me? People ask me, you know, um, there is past life involved. Um, and he, yeah, we knew each other and, and I, he's an old friend okay. and I discovered that when I met him, he first appeared to me, he beamed to me in my, in my room 
uh, in 2021. And I was really shocked. And then I was brought on his ship and I had revelations there. There, it's not, I'm not random, you know, being emissary of ETs randomly. Uh, yeah. I have contact with IA and I, and I have contact with the Galactic Federation of Worlds. In both cases, it was pre-agreed. Galactic Federation of Worlds, um, I have been working with them before coming here, and it was pre-agreed that I would have physical contact and be an emissary. But um, with Ia, I was there when all of this happened. Okay. Do you have full recall and full remembrance of that or partial? Partial for the moment. Every time I go and visit Ia and Ki, well, he's not the Enki. Enki means uh, the master of the regent of Earth. He's not anymore. He's just Ia. It's Ea or Ia is his real name. Every time I go and see him, uh, my memory reactivates and memories are brought to me. But it is so intense, you know, and emotional that it is given to me as much as I can take. Understood. And, and then you come back into um, into the kind of temporal um reality framework and you relay uh possibly yes. just it, it could be through the linguistic wave genetics of your dna resonance that you've been activated uh, because it operates at that level does it not it's not just psycho intellectual it's also the resonance that you 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 embody once you've received yes. that kind of um that kind of frequency upgrade you are then required to seed that into the temporal plane Sasha, I'm so glad you're bringing that up because that's a hot topic for me because I have been so much attacked that Helena has changed. She's not the same person. She's not talking in the same way. She's more dramatic. She's more this. She's more that. She's been cloned. She's been taken over. Lads, no, I've never been that close to who I am. And I am showing you by example, guiding you by example of who you are, who you are, who you're meant to be. When you wake up, you become calmer and more uh, happier. And, you know, and um, it, it, you, you become who you are and you're less stressed, you're less and you you look different because you have a different frequency. It's like wearing different new clothes, new haircut. You know, it's it's that's what it is about. Don't freak out, people. You you are all meant to to become who you are. So don't be scared and don't throw stones at me because I I assume it. That's, that's the thing, <laughs> Elena. That's the thing. So my my audience, the Lazarus, the Lazarus. Uh, <laughs> symposium audience is very enlightened. So I assure you, there is a universal uh, principle at work here. Anyone casting a stone, anyone making a judgment is conducting wrong action. There is no, never a need for condemnation or judgment. If you have a diverse or a divergent opinion, that's fine. Keep it to yourself. It's like people coming in and offering unsolicited advice. Uh, no, don't do that. Only offer advice when it's solicited. Ask questions when they answer questions when they are asked. But don't try and promulgate or proselytize or prescribe your worldview to someone else. And for sure, you do not condemn or go into public slander. This is an outrage as far as I'm concerned. Personally, I won't tolerate that. Um, you just don't do it. So good for you for having borne the rocks at the head and the slings and the arrows. I've done so much of this myself over the years, but it's just part also of this, um, this awakening, this kind of growing up that we need to do culturally and civilizationally. And uh, archetypes like yourself, in a sense, are born to take rocks at the head, <laughs> slings and arrows. <laughs> and, I, and I knew I, I would be able to, you know, and I, I am, you know, look at me. I'm not, I, I'm fine. I look, I, I am, I feel fine. I feel good, right. you know, because I can. Sasha, I would like to, to, to really emphasize on what you say about the humanity liberating themselves and people really breaking their chains of the chains of the illusion. You know, we were, I was mentioning uh, the religions becoming a way of enslaving people, the mentalities 
with having power over them. And these religions, certain most of the mainstream religions and uh, the Vatican, I cut it if your channel is going to be in trouble, the Vatican um, is, 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 the, is, okay. You know, when uh, Yahweh was in full power, the good faction of the Anunnaki, the Enki's scientists decided to do something, to bring an envoy to try to guide people and wake people up from slavery. It was Yeshua, Jesus. And they, um, Mary, his mother, was a descendant of the, the Abraham uh, and Adam, Adamic bloodline, you know, she, the patriarch, she, the mother. And um, so they abducted her, they inseminated her with uh, more enforcing uh, Anunnaki genetics, and she gave birth to a guy who, Yeshua, who was a hybrid and who tried really hard to wake mm -hmm. everybody up. And um, sorry, I need to plug my phone at the same time. Oh. <laughs> and right. um, yes, and he said to everyone, stop worshipping Yahweh. He's really evil and he's not your father. He's not my father. And um, sorry for that. It happens always when I say this. Here we go. And <laughs> so um, Yeshua just... He was so charismatic. He wakes, he woke up, he started to wake up humanity. But um, Enlil's faction uh, fought back by transforming, hijacking um, Yeshua's teaching into a death cult. And I'm sorry, that's the word, uh, yes, which yes, is a death cult. And when, when you see, you know, the, 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 the Vatican, I mean, I'm not going to go there, but it's a death cult. And they use the message of Yeshua, the, what they cannot destroy, they corrupt it. Okay. So to create a fear, a fear controlling uh, religion that say to people, go on your, knee, your knees, bend on your knees, you are nothing, you are born with sin, and you need to listen to the priest and the clergy. And if you want to save your soul. And uh, I mean, how evil is that? It is really, really wicked, you know? And for 2000 years, they've been doing this. Now it's time. And that's a message to all Christian, the Christian people who are going through this, because I'm not the only one to talk about that. Moro Biglino, Paul Wallis, Corinna Pataki, many Bible scholars are talking about this too. I'm not a Bible scholar, but I have contact with the, the good faction of the Anunnaki. So I know the same side, the same stories, you know, from another perspective, which is the same uh, story. Christians, pe Christian people do not freak out. You do not need the institution. The institution is a controlling human organization. What is Christianity? Christianity, go to the core of it. Go to what Yeshua was saying. What was he saying? Yeshua never asked to build churches, to have priests. He said, the kingdom of God is within you. You have direct access. What I can do, you can do too. You know, he was about empowering people. Uh, and go back to this. That's the core of Christianity. Throw this death cult institution you don't need that because you have the connection people and you know why because you are indeed at the image of god not right. your body your right. soul your soul and every consciousness in the universe is a fractal from creator source that is and on any planet in the universe that is why even the aliens the galactics they are also fractal of source. They are also children of God. There is no aliens or demons. That, that's, that's nonsense. All consciousness in the universe are a fractal of creator. That's yes. how you are made at this image of God. That's how you have the quantum connection. You do not need the institution. So that's Very my message. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So um, 
Can you just briefly describe, you mentioned uh, something, you alluded to something um, like 11 creator genus or species um, connected to the genesis of what we understand as the human today. And more or less, is that correct? Yes, there was that. That's the product of the experiment of the the cedars, the intergalactic confederation, who came. Um, I think it was sixty five billion year, million, sorry, million million years ago uh, on Earth, and uh, decided to because they seed life when you have planets that are which ecosystem is in trouble they're going to revive the ecosystem repopulate worlds that's what they do and they want to see uh, the the human uh, genome on earth you have you had already a creature that was going to evolve into a sort of hominid so they took this creature and they um slowly slowly with time they added they added uh, 10 other um different extraterrestrial genomes in this creature who became a beautiful human uh, hominid, you know, a human being. Uh, it could look like a homo sapien, uh, sapiens at the time, yeah. you know, a bit rough, but this guy, these guys were having already, they were already made of stardust. They were amazing already, you know, and they had a great potential. Still have. <laughs> So, you know? so can we name those um, creator uh, genus or those cosmic or galactic um, intelligences? Can we, the, the primary ones, of course, we know that there are scores, a multiplicity of cosmic or galactic ex genetic expressions and intelligences out there that have informed the genesis of man and what we've arrived at today. But can we more or less describe or name those primary types? I mean, mm -hmm. are they are they the popularly understood Alpha Centauri and Andromedan and Arcturian and you know what? Yes or no? You're shaking your head. Okay. No, no, no. These were from other galaxies, and they were named the main uh, leading uh, culture in this twenty-four. It's this group of twenty-four uh, scientist groups were the Patal. The very ancient culture from uh we they are so ancient that we cannot really trace where they from what galaxy they originate you know uh the people you, the cultures you just named before the andromedans pleiadians they are from our galaxy this galaxy nataru that we name here the milky way but the cedars they are from other galaxies so they're nothing to do with the people who live here um, so the Patal are tall humanoid beings with a long neck. Uh, oh, they are beautiful. They are beautiful. Bold head, big eyes, and a magnificent, very graceful. And then you have the Alteans. The Alteans are tall white people. Um, long white hair or yellow hair, like creamy hair. Um, slanted eyes, very like Asian eyes, but clear. They're beautiful. And these two are two main geneticist cultures. And then you have others I forgot. I wouldn't be able to name the 24. Yeah. <laughs> the the Hova, the, I don't remember all the other ones. Do. <laughs> so bringing it closer to home, um, speak about Mars and the relevancy of this emergent uh, theme or story of Mars and life on Mars and we need to visit Mars. What's the connection uh, with the Martians and, and Mars? And what would we find inhabiting? Who would we inha find inhabiting Mars today? So Mars is the closest inhabitable world that is easiest of access. So that's why we're talking a lot about it. Uh, Mars has been inhabited for a very long time before um, before the, 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 the fifth planet, uh, Maldek just exploded and wiped uh, all the, the atmosphere of, of Mars. Uh, there were civilizations on it, different ET civilizations. And uh, I know of four local uh, and civilizations there. Some of them were s coming from other galaxies or the star system, but they were living there for such a long time that they were Martians. So there were uh, the four that I know I've been made aware of. 
um, the the ones the two ones who still live there are a type of reptilians the tiru they are very nice and very spiritual people they are pacifist and you have insectoids uh, very territorial they are not um warmongers but they 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 defend their territories when needed um then who lived there but escaped when maldek exploded where uh what we call now the sasquatch and what we call now the ant people and the refugees on earth so some refugees on Venus, but main, most of them refugees on Earth. And what about human human population having been exfiltrated to Mars, uh, I believe, since the 1970s? But what, what, what of that? We'll find a, a human population there as well. I think the first Honobu, Honobu the first um, dark fleet Nachtwaffen Nazi uh, uh, spaceship, flying saucer, arrived on Mars in the 1940s, 47, I think. And maybe I'm wrong, but it's in the 1940s. Well, it was a disaster. They, they died, I think. But I know it. Well, we're on Mars. And then what next? Oh, <laughs> um, then they started to populate. So the dark fleet started to populate Mars. And they, they built this uh, station, Aries Prime. Uh, underground station, big station where the dark feet really set headquarters and human colonists came there, but they were uh, working at ens enslavement and creating super soldiers. Then the dark fleet developed their own uh, space programs, dark space programs where people would be abducted and taken in 20 and back uh, to the moon and Mars. And uh, also then some other dark program, SSP uh, programs on Earth, uh, notably some linked with US Air Force at the time, also joined and shared facilities and had their own uh, programs there on Mars, still working at developing and studying uh, super soldier technology, how to enhance human uh, capacities. And uh, they were using slave, uh, workers or 20 and back uh, people. Uh, and in 2021, when there's been this big war in the star system and a lot of clearing done, because there were reptilian Sikar as well, working with the dark fleet and there were a lot on Mars. All these people, the reptilians, they were all evacuated from Mars. They, what happened is the Galactic Federation of Worlds, you know, on Earth, they work with the White Hat, the Earth Alliance, empowering the locals to fight against their tyrants, against their slave masters. They empowering the locals, the local alliances, to 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 win their own wars. And it's it, they are not saving people. They are giving them the tools and training them that they, they they save themselves. They did the same for Mars. They created the Mars Mars Alliance, Tier Alliance, uh, where they trained. The local reptilians, the insectoid, it was a bit more difficult to train them, but they trained the, the local reptilians. They trained uh, resistance, um, uh, Maki resistance, and they formed them, they give them weapons, and they could take over the bases while the Federation was fighting in space. And then the, the, the whole perspective changed with Mars, uh, end of 2021 and 2022. In 2022, um, you know, new colonists could finally arrive. And we start to hear about, well, Elon Musk thinking about developing cities on Mars. They are already there, but we need to catch up psychologically. Right. Right. You know? exactly. exactly right. It's just uh, tinkering with the conceptual frameworking so that we can begin to have this new uh, storylines uh, installed without, as you say, mass panic of pandemonium. Um, you know, Elena, uh, I was telling Michael on this interview that he was doing with me yesterday, uh, Michael Sala, about um, uh, my friendship with the, the former uh, NASA uh, astronaut scientist, Dr. Brian O'Leary, who had been, um, he was lined up to lead the mission to Mars in the 1970s, I think it was. And they, Congress pulled the budget they were planning to do that mission. It was a big hoo-ha at the time. Dr. Brian O'Leary was in training and getting ready for it. 
uh, with his crew and he was the lead astronaut scientist. They then pulled the mission. Uh, he was obviously devastated about that. Um, we became friendly in the years before his death. And at one point, uh, the last time I saw him when he came and stayed with me in my home in London with his wonderful wife, uh, Meredith, um, he had just been returning from a, a, a conference in, I think, Barcelona, where he was um, uh, disclosing in this small conference the fact that the Japanese space program um, who had jointly funded the um, Saturn probe mission with NASA, the Japanese had picked up much of the, 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 the tab on that mission and the live feeds coming in from the Japanese space program um, showed that as the probe was approaching the rings of Saturn, it could see alien craft over 200 kilometers long mining the rings of Saturn. Well, the Japanese went ballistic when they saw this uh, coming through on the feeds. NASA and the Pentagon contacted Japan and said, under no circumstances do you release that to the public. The Japanese said, go fuck yourselves. We funded this. We'll do what we want. We, we will. That didn't turn out too well for the Japanese. Fukushima and all sorts of takedown of Japan followed mm -hmm. resultantly. Yep. And if you remember, the 80s and 90s, Japan was taking over the world. It was buying up everything. It was a booming economy. And the, the Sabbateans took, took Japan pretty much down and threw them back 50 years. But the point I'm making is this, is that Japan was ready for disclosure uh, decades ago. Uh, they contacted Dr. Brian O'Leary and asked him to please, uh, as, a, as a, an agent of disclosure and a former NASA astronaut scientist, will you please tell the world the truth? And here are the photographs. I saw them of these uh, sp alien craft ringing the, uh, mining the rings of Saturn. The, I'm leading here to my next question, um, which is, you mentioned intriguing discoveries on Saturn and fascinating phenomena surrounding Jupiter. Can you just uh, provide further insight into these remarkable findings and again, their implications on us Earthlings? Sure, sure. Well, Jupiter, there behind Jupiter is a stargate, a natural portal, natural stargate that is locked in uh, the most distant orbit of Jupiter. So it goes with it. This stargate is um, has been used by extraterrestrials to come into our star system. There is a network of wormholes and stargates in the whole universe, and you can take shortcuts you can jump from one to the other and travel very fast. So that's one of them. And recently, um, NASA had started talking about this uh, a, a stargate uh, that just disturbs the, the, the course of asteroids or comets when they pass nearby. And that's just kind of a portal. Anyways, th th that, that portal um, has been some uh, secret spa uh, space program uh, witnesses have been talking also about this. I know Tony Rodriguez uh, have describes going through the Stargate. Uh, I was one taken through it. It's not a pleasant experience. I'm not looking forward to do it again, indeed. But <laughs> uh, yes, so and that's why around Jupiter, there is, there is so much people, everyone is around Jupiter. Why? The fleet of the Intergalactic Confederation, 500 mother ships at the moment. Um, Enki has moved the Nibiru ship there. Ganymede, the moon Ganymede, has uh, all the outposts representing all the organization. It's quite full. And you have in the higher uh, atmosphere of Jupiter, the Ashtar Galactic Command uh, base outpost, um, uh, which is there controlling, it's a military mercenary uh, of, uh, organization that controls who comes and goes. Anyways, that's what's going on, on around Jupiter. And at the moment, because uh, the solar system has been freed uh, from the regressive aliens, uh, now yeah. people can safely come in. So then uh, that's too many people, it's too much. So they decided, the, the ETs decided, uh, with in coordination with the Earth Alliance, because 
Earth is the most advanced local civilization in this star system. So we have the custody of it now, finally. Mm. So we have this, the, the last word to say, you know, in the decision. So they they are now building together a hub, like a, a deep space space station uh, in the vicinity of the Stargate that everyone can come and dock their ships. And it's going to be more practical for everyone who wants to come and trade. And it's going to be the, the fun place to, to be uh, in the future. And, well, so we that, can talk about the future, but not that far away. I mean, we're talking about no. the Oh, no, no. Once it's, you know, once the technologies, all the patents on the blocked technologies, and there's more than 6,000, it's, once it's available and it's unlocked and available, this is going to be so, to go so fast. That's right. That's going to be really weird for everyone who hasn't yet made the effort to, to open their mind to change. You oh. know, that's why at the moment, we are working so hard at telling the humans like it is a real they are here they've been here all along and one day you wake up and you you, you say oh and you you for you it's it's natural it's a normal information it's part of your reality but you don't remember how this get into your head that's yeah. very clever you know fascinating well you know i for many years i've been involved with my foundation humanitad for many years involved in brokerage and um, sort of backroom diplomacy trying to bring um some of the exopolitics uh, arena of thought into um government and even religious leaders so i've i've convened meetings between um, even people like Edgar Mitchell. I was creating introductions and conversations between him and religious leaders to talk about extraterrestrials and then to bring people like Dr. Brian O'Leary into the United Nations, which I did as well in, in 2010, uh, to try and engender conversations there. It's been an uphill struggle and it's not my main forte or my main wheelhouse, but it's something I've been uh, peripherally involved in, but fairly dynamically over the years. Um, and it, it's a it's an extraordinary subject, the business of finally dragging our face out of the trough and looking up at the, the stars and the sky and just embracing this mantle of the majesty of what it is to be an angelic human. What do you make of this um, et the etymology of the word human? I understand from oh. multiple sources that it's a derogatory term. It means monster. Um, and a monster is, you know, has its own definitions. But what are your thoughts of the word human? Well, uh, these are made of two extraterrestrial words, at my knowledge. Hu means uh, the, the, the human consciousness, the consciousness of the, the human species. And every different, every species has a different structured consciousness, a different essence, frequency essence of consciousness. And who? is the the would say human human consciousness who human soul who so it's a type of consciousness and man is um the an original star system in the lyra constellation where the who were first seeded so they are the who from man that have spread which is a bit not right on earth because we shouldn't call us who man from man, because we were not coming from man. We were seeded there by the Intergalactic Confederation in the second time, and set as a second experiment in time. We should call ourselves the Who Terra, the Terra Who, <laughs> the humans of Terra, you know? So that, that's how I'm explaining this. So finally, a sort of a kind of moral conundrum here. And a, a philosophical question, and one that speaks to the root of our spirit, the human spirit, which, as you rightly say, is, is steeped in trauma. And we are a foundationally traumatized genus. And it, it's, it's, it's a calamity because that trauma is what begets bad ideation. And, and as we project bad ideas into the field, ideas based on scarcity, on fear, on trauma, on that's how blood cult 
emerges and the death spiral mechanics emerges and war and disease and poverty become the source code of our civilizational cycles because of this again foundational trauma now we didn't ask presumably at the soul level to be traumatized and butchered and subjugated and genetically manipulated and abducted and so don't you think that all of this speaks to a, 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 a great wrong action on the part of the gods? Why engender suffrage, the trial of separation, sorrow, misery, and blood cult onto an unsuspecting species that you're creating? Because when, because while you are focused on striving, surviving, paying your bills, eating, you do not focus on developing yourself, becoming who you are, developing your potential. You're just, if you are in a survival mode, and that's what the deep state has always wanted us to, to keep us in survival mode, dependence mode from governments, etc., money, etc., that we, we are, as slaves, only focus on surviving on our dependence, working to pay our bills, etc. cetera. Um, and while we do that, we do not focus on the real stuff. Who are we and developing our potential, unlocking our potential? That is why. Um, what I want to say, um, it went out of my mind. Um, I, I was, uh, I, I wasn't, that wasn't quite addressing the question I asked, which was okay. really that's the why question, the question I'm trying to aim at is what kind of gods, oh. what kind of um, creatures, intelligences would program or permit foundational suffrage and uh, misery and the trial of separation? That's my question. It's a condemnation okay. of the gods. Yeah. Uh, it's more a reptilian mind to do these kind of things. But the thing is, Okay, humans, the, the who, soul, consciousness. We have a, spe a special power. We can influence the web of reality, the matrix. We are creators. We can create. We can, with the power of our mind, of our manifestation, we have the ability to distort the web of reality and model it as we want. And... The enemies know that. They cannot right. do that. The reptilians cannot do that. The greys cannot do that. Other species okay. cannot do that. But the, the who can. Very good. And so when you manipulate this power, you can get the who to create a reality as you want. You use right. them. And that's how you are going to come up with psychological operations that are going to, for instance, um say oh my oh fear everyone there's a there's a disease coming wiping the planet and we're gonna go to die and this 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 so you you believe that because you are vulnerable because of the fear you create the fear vibration you manifest it and you start to create yourself that um, reality, that yeah. reality. Mm -hmm. but there's nothing yeah. Climate change, uh, things like this, you know, uh, it's not only that, that, that way, but they, they know how, we, if we don't know our power, they know and they yeah. use us to yeah. create reality they want and they're not able to create themselves. Understood. And my, my audience completely understands this uh, quantum phenomenon of the, the fact that the human is the, is the cosmic or the divine capacitor and we are the ones that ideate and uh, project uh, ideas into the field which manifest as reality, which is why we've been subjugated and subject over millennia to the trickery of uh, and the, the negative influences of uh, intelligences and forces that know that so long as humans can be contained and their plasma can be projected at will uh, as a collective meme, that's what keeps a parasite cycle, civilizational and galactic cycles going. So that we understand absolutely um but going beyond ra going beyond enki and lil nenhusad and these great genesis god uh influences behind them 
Surely we have a singularity Godhead, an Atman, an Alpha Omega that is entirely born of love and benevolence, entirely born of affirmation and light. At the origin of everything, you have source, the creator source, the, or, the origin singularity of everything that lives in no space and no time. Okay, it's not on linear time, it's not in a physical space, it's source, it's the original point of everything, physical matter and consciousness. Source is, of course, one, but if it was just one, it wouldn't work because you need a dynamo, you need an engine, you need an engine to produce something, okay? So the engine, what is it? It's two electrodes, positive and negative. I mean, creation, destruction. So one is made of two and two create one. Uh, the two is the dynamo, the dynamics, always fighting for balance with creation, always a little bit higher. Destruction is necessary for this, this fight for balance, fight for balance that is going to create the energy and the, make the, the universe work. Destruction will be played out as creation will be played out by the consciousness that consciousnesses that shoot off from the source, core source. It shoots consciousness all the time and imbues them in to matter, okay? So some of them will play out the destruction agenda. Some of them will play out the creation agenda. It can be individuals, it can be cultures, planetary cultures, empires. Yeah. And when one big empires, like the Nebu have been recently, when one big empire is um, subdued and disappeared and is non-existent anymore, another one raises because you need because trigger and challenge is going to create evolution is going to make of you a more clever person stronger person and you're going to be a better uh, version of yourself which would have never happened if you were happy in your little world and nothing comes and challenge you Very it's good. tough but that's the dynamics of the universe. And when you understand that, this is, you know, you, the day I remember this, um, now everyone who comes and attack me, um, if it uses in the past, it used to either upset me or anger me. And I was thinking, oh, because it, resonates with a wound in myself I need to heal. Thank Bravo. you for showing me where the healing is. Bravo. And now, you know, uh, people, there's a lot of people, I, I take my example because it's easy, I know it. Um, people are going to gather in groups to hate me. They feel compelled to hate me and criticize me. And some are so obsessive. And, you know, when you know this, when you have this higher perspective, you take it as an honor and privilege to play the role of the trigger for this person that in me, they see their own wounds and then it comes at the surface and they're able to, once they identify it, to heal it. Mm -hmm. And it is, a, it is a privilege to do that, to, be, to play this role to other humans who are going to discover this, you know? So when you, you need to see everything from the, the higher perspective of source and everything makes sense you know indeed it does that the geometry of now is perfect always in all ways and once we take that uh, that uh, seat and that throne of witness in in the, in the living moment uh, and we see the perfection in all things in all ways uh, that that is when joy comes into us we move into attunement and alignment and coherence with our with the god within and we become truly sons and daughters of god in that sense I'm very grateful for your time. I got a great deal more than I uh, bargained for today. And I'm very, very happy <laughs> at it. And I'm greatly looking forward to seeing you on the panel as well at the symposium. Elena Danan, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Sasha, for all you do. Thank you.